It's not at all uncommon for Christians to be asked, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It may be a total stranger that comes to you on the street and asks this. It may be a coworker, it may be a neighbor, it may be a relative, but, but perhaps many of you have had someone ask you this question. And the fact is that many people in the religious world, in fact, a lot of Christians, are confused when you bring up the subject of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, many people simply do not understand what it is or what it was and the related facts about it. As evidence of that, we hear people saying, well, should, should I pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Still others sometimes ask, well, well, how will I know if or, or when I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And sometimes young Christians will ask, well, how will the Holy Spirit's baptism affect my life? How will it affect me as, as a child of God? And, and many other questions will be raised. And perhaps the most confusing fact is that all of those who claim to have received Holy Spirit baptism do not function like, and, and I couldn't find a better way to word this, but they don't function like or they don't act like the people that we read about in the New Testament who had received baptism of the Holy Spirit. In other words, when you compare what happened in the book of Acts with what we see allegedly going on in the religious world today, there is a vast difference. They are not the same, they're not even similar in many respects. But back to the question, do people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit today? And closely related to this, the question, do people receive miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit? I would suggest to you that if people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit today, that they disobey numerous instructions of the Holy Spirit. At least four that I can think of, perhaps even more. For example, they, they disobey the instructions of the Holy Spirit because they refuse to perform some of the signs, some of the miraculous signs which Jesus said they would do if and when they had that. Look back at the text that was read for us just a moment ago. And this text of, of Mark 16, 17, and 18 is a favorite passage of those who claim to have miraculous gifts of the Spirit and to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They will run to this passage. But yet, when you begin to press them on it, they will run away from it. Because they are not obeying it. Notice again, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. And then notice what the passage says, and I'm abbreviating here. He says they're going to cast out devils. They're going to speak in tongues. He said they're going to take up deadly serpents, literally vipers, deadly poisonous snakes. Not only that, he said when they drink poison, they're not going to be hurt. And finally, he says they will heal the sick. Now it's interesting, those who claim to have miraculous gifts today and those who claim to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they will say, oh yes, we can speak in tongues. And usually they'll give you a demonstration. Some of them will say, oh yes, we, we can heal the sick. And invariably it's something that can't be seen, such as an ulcer or a problem with their head or, or some internal difficulty they have, maybe stomach, stomach disorders. But I've never yet seen one of them restore an ear that had been cut off. I've never yet seen one give the ability to walk to a man who was born crippled and been crippled all of his life. I've never seen them bring someone from the grave that's been there four days as Lazarus was. But again, some will claim that they can perform uh, healings of the sick. Some will even go so far as to say, oh yes, we can cast out demons. We can cast the devil out of people. And they will give demonstrations of that. But two of these things, they very seldom, one of them almost never, will they try to perform. Some of them will take up snakes. I've seen it. Maybe you've seen it. I saw a guy and... and, and I had to wonder about his intelligence, but he had a big rattlesnake in his hand, and he was holding that thing up in his face, and I thought, I hope it bites you on the nose. 
anybody dumb enough to put a rattlesnake up in his face and talk to it, he's going to get into heaven with babies anyway. But you don't need me to tell you the rattlesnake is not a deadly snake. If you'll do some reading, it'll make you sick and make you think you're going to die. But normally rattlesnake bites are not deadly unless you have a heart condition or unless you're a little child. A lot of people have been bitten by rattlesnakes and live. That doesn't impress me. But you show me the Pentecostal who will pick up a cobra and put it in his face. I'll give you any odds you want. He'll be dead in 30 seconds. For that matter, you, you never see one of them pick up a mamba, one of the deadliest snakes in the world. It takes about 15 seconds to die from, from even a slight bite from the mamba. You see, they'll take some mildly poisonous snake that most anybody can survive, and they'll play with it. But the one you seldom see them practice, in fact, I've never known of them, is for someone to give them a glass of strychnine and they turn it up and chug a lug it. It won't take long. They don't like that one. Especially, now some in the past have brought in a glass and said, I have poison here. And somebody said, no, let us provide the poison. That put a damper on that demonstration in a hurry. Now, if they really have these gifts, because if you look at what Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. And then he lists them. It wasn't they got to pick one of them. And I'm not saying that every Christian had the ability to perform every one of these things. But you see, there were brethren who could do one, and another brother could do this one. But you don't find any of them today that want to drink arsenic or strychnine. And you don't find many of them today who will handle an extremely deadly viper. Why? Because they don't have the ability. And if they can do some of the signs, why don't they do them all? As Jesus said they would do. But not only that, they disobey the instructions of the Holy Spirit because they are conflicted doctrinally. It's amazing to, if you begin to study and to look, there's so many religious groups who claim or have claimed in the past to be able to receive miraculous measures of the Spirit. Many people don't know it, but the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we know them better as the Mormons, they claim to have it. Not only do Pentecostal groups claim to have these gifts, but, but others such as many of your Baptist groups. And other denominations claim to receive the miraculous gifts of the Spirit. Now, they all have differing degrees of what they claim to be able to do. Some say we can do some uh, of these miracles, but not others. But if they're all led by the Spirit, if they all receive the baptism of the same Holy Spirit, why aren't they all preaching and practicing the same thing? There should be no divisions. There should be no doctrinal differences between groups that claim to have the miraculous baptism of the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. The same Holy Spirit now. This is inspired. The same Holy Spirit through the pen of Paul said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. That's unity, that's harmony, and that's not being done. And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared unto me, uh, excuse me, unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now one translation says that there are divisions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. But then notice verse 13, he asked the question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? You see, the fact that they are divided, the fact that all of these groups teach something different, should tell us they don't have what they claim to have, or they would all be preaching the same thing as the Holy Spirit instructed but not only that, they are disobeying the instructions of the Holy Spirit when they use tongues for self-edification. Don't want to spend much time on this point. We touched on it, I believe it was last week or the week before. But look at 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Here Paul says that the sign 
was for those that believe not. Signs were for unbelievers. They were for non-Christians. They were to convince them. They were never in the New Testament described as something designed to prove that I have been saved. Never are the gift of tongues spoken of as being my means of communicating to God in this ecstatic language. But rather it was for the purpose of convincing and persuading non-Christians that this is what God would have them to do. And if you doubt it, go back and read Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, and then verse 8 and verse 11. In fact, read the entire second chapter of Acts, the first gospel sermon that was preached there by Peter. And notice what he says happened there. This gift of tongues, this miraculous language that the apostles spoke. It was designed not only so these people could hear the gospel in their own language or their own tongue, but also it proved to them these men are all Galileans. They knew that the apostles did not have the ability to speak these languages, and yet they were doing it. And this was evidence, this was proof that they were from God. But not only that, these people disobey the Holy Spirit's instructions when they speak in a tongue, as they call it, without someone to interpret. And this is not at all uncommon. In fact, frequently, if you'll ask someone who's claiming to speak into, well, what are you saying? I don't know. We have to have an interpreter. What do you have? Well, no, we don't have anybody here that can interpret today. But listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 27, 28. It clearly states that one who had the gift of tongues in the New Testament time was to remain silent if there was no one there to interpret. Listen to Paul. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, and by the way, we pointed out before and again that that word unknown was put there by the translators. It's not in the original. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or three by most, and that by course, and let one interpret. And then verse 28, he says, but if there be no interpreter, notice, let him keep silence in the church. And yet we don't see that being obeyed. Paul says even if there's an interpreter, only two or three should speak, and then one at a time. And this is so different from what you see today in many Pentecostal groups. You'll have a half a dozen people around the building all up speaking gibberish at the same time. That's not what inspiration says. And so they're violating the Holy Spirit's instructions when they do this. But not only, here's another thought. If people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit today, they are limiting the Holy Spirit's power when they fail to do certain things. For example, Jesus said in John 14, 26, if you want to be turning there, but when these people fail to remember everything that Jesus said and taught, they're proving that they don't have it. Because Jesus said that would happen. John 14, 26. He says, but the Comforter, and then he goes on to clarify, which is the Holy Ghost. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, notice, he shall teach you some things? No. He shall teach you all things. A-L-L. That's everything. Not a part of, not some of. But he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, if one truly has the Holy Ghost, if one truly has the Holy Spirit as they had it in the New Testament times, specifically the apostles with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then, of course, later Cornelius, and we're going to touch on that later. But if they had the same thing the apostles had, then they should remember everything that Jesus said. He said that's what the Comforter would do. And yet I don't know anybody in the religious world today who says, I remember everything Jesus ever said. See, they're limiting the power of the Holy Spirit. And not only that, they don't know all truth. And, and again, I don't know any that claim it, but again, John 16, 13 repeats part of what we just read. Jesus said, how be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, if the Holy Spirit guides this man into all truth, and he guides this man into all truth, are they not going to be saying the same thing? Is all truth relevant? Does it change from religious group to religious group? You see, if they all have all truth, there's going to be unity. There's going to be harmony, not only in worship, but in doctrine, in preaching. 
there'll be complete harmony. And if they really had the miraculous baptism of the Holy Spirit, there would be no conflicting creed books. You know, you got so many groups that have their creed books, their catechisms, their disciplines, their manuals that they follow. And most of them disagree. Maybe not 100% disagreement, but they disagree a lot. But yet, if we truly had the baptism of the Holy Spirit today, these things wouldn't exist. But not only that, they limit the power of God because they do not raise the dead. In Acts chapter 9 and verse 41, and we're just going to mention it, not going to take time to read it. But in Acts chapter 9 and verse 41, we find the, a sister by the name of Dorcas died. And Dorcas was a good woman. She was loved. She was respected. And so they sent for Peter. Now, I don't know whether they expected Peter to raise her from the dead or not, but Peter comes down and, and they're, they're crying and grieving and they're showing all the garments that she had made for the poor. And, and you can imagine, oh, she was a wonderful lady. She was a fine Christian. And Peter raises her from the dead. Why? Because he had the power. And he demonstrated it. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20 and verse 10 was preaching and there was a young man sitting in a window and, and I guess Paul got long-winded that night because this young man fell asleep. He fell out of the window and died. And the brethren were grieving. They weren't expecting Paul to raise him from the dead, but he did. How did Paul do that? Because he had the power now, does anyone know of a case where that's happened? I mean, first-hand information. Don't tell me about a friend of a friend whose grandmother told. That's usually what we get. They can't do this, and thus they limit the Spirit's power. But not only that, they limit the power of the Holy Spirit because they fail to strike blasphemers blind as Paul did. I was talking with a Pentecostal one time, and and I was trying to get him to prove, you know, do a miracle. Oh, you're just testing God. I said, no, I, I just want the evidence. I, you know, that's the purpose. You know, if you can do a genuine miracle, just one's all I want to see, a genuine miracle, I'll change what I teach. Oh, well, I can't do that. You, you, you're testing God. I said, what about Paul? And of course, Acts chapter 13. Paul was trying to preach the gospel to a man. Well, let's just read it. Acts 13, beginning in verse 6. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus. Sergius Paulus was a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elamus the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Now notice what Paul does, verse 9. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, All full of subtlety and mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind. Paul didn't say, you're tempting the Lord, you're testing the Lord. Here was a man who was interfering in the preaching of God's word. God struck him blind. And I brought this up to that man. I said, look, I'm interfering with your teaching. I'm telling people you're a, you're a false teacher. I'm telling people that you can't do it. You should do what Paul did. Strike me blind. Not only will you convince me, but you convince these other people. He didn't do it. Couldn't do it. But not only that, these people limit the power of the Holy Spirit. When they fail to remove all doubt from unbelievers. Remember what happened in Acts chapter 4 and verse 16? Just one quick verse here. Saying, what shall we do? Now this is the council. This is the Sanhedrin after the apostles have performed a miracle. What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. And I think I mentioned this in one of our earlier studies. You don't find anyone in the New Testament denying the miracles of Jesus or of the apostles. Never once did they say, oh, well, Lazarus wasn't really dead. Dorcas really wasn't dead. Or, or Eutychus wasn't really dead. It was just trickery. No. 
They never denied it. Now with the Lord, they attribute it to the devil. He does it by Beelzebub. He does it by the prince of demons. But they never tried to disprove it. No one tried to say, oh, that crippled man wasn't really crippled. He was faking. He, he was a plant. They brought him in from over at Rome. No, they knew who he was. They knew he was a cripple. Nobody questioned it. And so the miracles that they did by the power of the Spirit of God, they silenced the critics. They confirmed the fact that Paul was preaching or the other apostles were preaching. But before leaving this point, I want to mention that some who claim to have miraculous measure of the Holy Ghost will deny that others who claim to have the same miraculous measure of the Holy Ghost are genuine. You want an interesting discussion, you ask certain self-proclaimed miracle workers. I don't know what else to call them. They call themselves miracle workers or faith healers. But you ask them about others and they'll say, he's a fake. And most of them acknowledge that there are some charlatans out there, but yet they all claim to have the same spirit. They acknowledge these fakes have made false claims and they will admit that there are some fake miracles that have been done. And my question to them is at this point, how am I supposed to know the difference? How is a non-Christian, the person you're trying to convert, how is he to distinguish between you, the genuine article you say, and the fake healer? Surely the Holy Spirit didn't do a very good job. If he's giving us this confusion, remember the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. But let's consider another question. Just what is this baptism of the Holy Spirit that we're talking about? It? And perhaps a lot of the problem, a lot of the difficulty stems from the fact that many people don't know what it was. First of all, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a promise. It was never commanded. It was a promise by the Lord. Notice Luke 24, 49. Jesus said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And then just the very next uh, page or two in your Bible, Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, and this is right before the Lord ascended back into heaven. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And if we keep reading there in Acts chapter 2, we find the apostles receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Cornelius is the only other recorded example over in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. And by the way, if you study that account in Acts 10 of the conversion of Cornelius, the events that took place at Cornelius' house, they reminded Peter of what happened at the beginning. In fact, listen to what he said in Acts 11. He is recounting what happened in chapter 10. He's been called on to explain why he went into those Gentiles to eat and to preach. Listen to what he says in verse 15. And as I began to speak, that is before he preached, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye should be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now notice verse 17, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Now keep in mind, it's generally believed that it's been some seven to ten years, depending on who you read, but it's been some seven to ten years since the day of Pentecost in chapter 2 to the conversion of Cornelius here in Acts chapter 10. Let me ask you something. Why would Paul, or excuse me, why would Peter be reminded of a like gift that was received seven, eight, nine, ten years earlier if every convert had been receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit just like the apostles and just like Cornelius? No big deal. Happened every day. Every time somebody was baptized, every time somebody obeyed the gospel, they'd receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nothing unusual. But this was unusual. He said, this reminded me of what happened seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Why? Because it wasn't an everyday occurrence. In fact, these are the only two recorded accounts. Now, it's obvious that the Apostle Paul received it, but we don't have an account of it from what he writes. But something else we need to understand about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was received directly from heaven. 
There was no human intervention, <clears throat> excuse me, there was no human intervention, there was no human assistance. In Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10 both, it, it was a miraculous event from God, from heaven. And in both cases, it was accompanied by speaking in tongues, which served a purpose. Two different purposes, actually. Not only that, Holy Spirit baptism served as God's witness. And we've already touched on this, so I don't intend to spend a lot of time here. But again, Holy Spirit baptism proved that the apostles were indeed God's spokesmen. One verse we mentioned, I'll remind you of again, Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Now, in regard to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, it served as God's witness that the Gentiles could be saved by the same gospel, as Peter says in chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. Stop and think about it. Holy Spirit baptism did just as much for you and me as it did for Cornelius in the New Testament. It did just as much for us as it did for the Gentiles. Remember, we're the Gentiles. I don't think we have any Jews in our audience. We're the Gentiles. And Holy Spirit baptism served to convince Peter and those six Jewish brethren who would come with him to teach the gospel. Or actually, he had come to preach the gospel. They had come to serve, I guess, more or less as witnesses or traveling companions. But it served to show them that God accepted the Gentiles and that they could be his children. In fact, verse 47 and verse 48, Peter said, Can any man forbid water? that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. Verse 48, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. And of course, Peter's words in 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 confirm this. You remember Peter said, The like figure wherein too even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. Something else you need to understand about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It ceased by AD 64. You say, wait a minute. How do you know? How do you know that Holy Spirit baptism ended by AD 64? It's simple if you think about it. It is generally agreed by Bible scholars across the board that the book of Ephesians was penned by 64 AD. No one puts the date any later that I know of. Now Paul in Ephesians 4 and verse 5 said, among other things, there is one baptism. Remember, there have been two. There's been water baptism. There's been baptism of the Holy Spirit. But in Ephesians 4 and 5 said there's only one baptism. Which baptism are you talking about, Paul? Remember, there are two, water and the Holy Spirit. So which one ceased? Which one of them was no longer in force? If water baptism ceased, then nobody has a right to baptize in water today. We shouldn't be doing it. If Holy Spirit baptism ceased, then those who claim to have it are mistaken. They're false teachers. And if we practice both, as some religious groups do, then we have two baptisms. And that contradicts what Paul said when he said there's only one baptism. You see, you can't have it both ways. And the answer is pretty obvious. By the time Paul penned those words of Ephesians 4 and verse 5, Holy Spirit baptism was done. It was passed. It had served its purpose. It was no longer available. It no longer existed. And so now there was one baptism. We need to understand that water baptism is commanded for all believers of every generation. And again, most religious groups, at least not many religious groups, will deny that water baptism is a command. Now, and you will get a difference of opinion as to the purpose and the mode of baptism and, and things about it. But most religions agree that baptism is a command in the New Testament. Now, if Cornelius and his family were saved directly by the Holy Spirit baptism, why did they need to be baptized in water? What was the purpose? And furthermore, if Cornelius was saved directly by Holy Spirit baptism, why did he need Peter to begin with? 
come and preach words to him as he was instructed. The Holy Spirit could have just saved him and his household and saved that trip, that time. Peter could have been spending his time preaching to somebody else. If Cornelius was going to be saved directly by the Holy Spirit, separate and apart from the Word. But you see, the truth of the matter is Cornelius and his family needed remission of sins just like those people in Acts 2. And they were told when they asked what to do to have that remission of sins to repent and be baptized. But not only that, remember that water baptism must be administered by man. In the Great Commission of Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus told his disciples to go and to teach and then they were to baptize those believers. And they were to instruct those believers to teach others and they were to baptize their converts. And it was a perpetual thing. But unlike Holy Spirit baptism, which was administered by God, this water baptism we're talking about was administered by man. And we have numerous examples of this. Acts chapter 8, we're not going to read it, but you remember the conversion of the Ethiopian nobleman. Philip taught him... He said, what doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if you believe in Jesus, that he's the Son of God, you can be. And he made the good confession. They stopped the chariot. They went out in the water and he baptized him. But you see, it took a man to baptize the eunuch in that water. But one other thought, it's vitally important that we understand that water baptism is an act of faith that is necessary, that is essential in order for us to have salvation. We already read 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. People sometimes say, well, why? What's so important about baptism? Well, Romans 6, 3 and 4 gives the answer. Baptism puts us into Jesus Christ. Baptism puts us into Christ. Where salvation is found, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10. And if you read Romans 6, 3, and 4, Paul goes on to explain that after we're baptized, we are raised to walk. We come up out of the water, and that eliminates sprinkling, by the way. You can't be raised up from a sprinkling or a pouring. But when you come up out of the water as the eunuch did, we walk in newness of life. We're going to be a changed person. In Romans 6, 17, and 18, Paul touches on this when he said, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but now ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. You see, when they obeyed the gospel, when they were baptized, they went from being the servants of sin to being the servants of righteousness. They went from being children of the devil to being children of God. Now understand, salvation is by faith. It's not meritorious works. It's not something that we can do to earn, if you will, or to merit our salvation. But you see, when we have saving faith, we're going to respond by repenting of our sins. We're going to respond by confessing that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. And we're going to be baptized as the culminating act of that faith by which we become Christians. And in baptism, we are put into Christ, as we noticed just a few moments ago. And again, I want to emphasize this. Water baptism is the one baptism that was going to contend, excuse me, continue till the end of the earth. We mentioned Ephesians 4 and verse 5 said there's one baptism. And Jesus said that he would be with them in carrying out that commission, in carrying out that New Testament baptism. He said, I'll be with you to the end of the world. Obviously, water baptism was to last till the end of time. You show me the verse that says that about Holy Spirit baptism. You don't find it. Again, it has ceased. I had one more point that I was going to touch on but don't have time to, uh, to cover it all at this time. But I did want to talk about how we're born of water and the Spirit in John chapter 3 and verse 5 and we may deal with that uh, in a later lesson. But we're going to close our study this morning by extending the invitation of Christ. If you're not yet a child of God, you don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You don't need some miracle in your life. You simply need to know the gospel. You need to know the good news. You need to believe it. You need to repent and turn from your sins, be sorry for what you've done, and turn away from them. You need to confess the name of Jesus, that He is the Christ, the Son of God. 
And you need to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. And as we saw a moment ago, God will add you to his body, the church, Acts 2.47. You will be put into Christ, Galatians 3.27, Romans 6, 3 and 4, where salvation is found. And then, of course, you must be faithful unto death, according to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. I hope that this study has helped to clarify some questions in regard to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not only do we need to know it for ourselves, but we need to know how to explain to others because there is so much misunderstanding in the religious world today in regard to this question. And we need to be able, as Peter said, to give an answer to those that ask us. But as I say, we're going to extend the invitation of Christ. If you need to become a Christian or if you simply need the prayers of the church, will you come while we stand and while we sing?